Okay. Hi, Stephen Johnson here, organizer for Teach OSM, and uh, amongst other things. Um, first of all, let me get this out of the way. I have a bit of imposter syndrome here, standing here, because uh, Elodie Nix uh, should really be presenting this today. And, uh, but she unfortunately couldn't be here. She had a conflict, so I'm presenting in her stead. Um, and I'm introducing a program that we are, let's see, here we go. Let's click slideshow. Here we go. Um, this is a program that we started uh, with our, our uh, partners at American Geographical Society. And uh, it's a program to engage uh, youth, basically, and get them involved with uh, open mapping at a earlier age. And uh, it, has, it has several objectives here, to facility with digital technology, specifically with geo, uh, geospatial technologies, and to foster kind of a community and connectedness locally uh, with peers, and focus on, on, the st on geo STEM education, and uh, specifically uh, women's leadership and mentorship with, um, with geospatial technologies. Um, currently, there are five chapters. This is a pilot program. It's been going on for six months. Uh, 140 students involved, and uh, almost 70% of them are uh, uh, young women and girls involved in this program. Um, this is kind of the programming overview that we've uh, had for the last six months. It's organized thematically. Uh, typically, the uh, students will meet uh, once or twice a month, and uh, these are the kind of the six thematic modules that we've come up with. Um, we have uh, at each of these, um, there's a pre-selected mapping task. We usually put those on the Teach OSM Tasking Manager. Um, we also included with that uh, include uh, mentors and uh, people who have technical expertise and um, leadership in geospatial education and things like that. Um, there's a website organized with it. Um, this is all kind of locally run, so there's like little pods of this. It's modeled kind of after youth mappers. Uh, in, in terms of programmatic structure. We've built a website with this um, with where there's a lot of materials that have been consolidated. And uh, this is kind of our governance structure here is, is, a, is a steering committee that oversees and directs the programming and uh, works with teachers to kind of solicit feedback and things that we can improve along the way. So we have kind of this self-reinforcing feedback loop as, as we go. This, I think, is a really cool feature, is uh, getting students to actually talk about their experiences with mapping and um, what it means with this. And these are all posted on the website if you want to just kind of get a flavor for some of the postings that they put up. But a lot of this is um, student-directed, which is really kind of cool. It's not like you need to write a blog post. It's like students volunteer to do this kind of thing, which is really nice. Um, the workflow, this, uh, we have a national mapathon each semester. We had one uh, last uh, May 18th, and uh, we had guest speakers during the whole thing and music and, and uh, a lot of, it was all conducted virtually. Uh, some of the students met in person in different places, uh, but it was nice kind of people dropping in and dropping out. It's, it's like old school mapathon. It was a lot of fun. This, I think, is another an interesting aspect, is, is making students aware of opportunities uh, you know, for career development in terms of geography. I, I think um, a lot of us who uh, came along in legacy geography programs uh, spent a lot of time memorizing the capitals of, you know, of European countries and the principal exports of El Salvador, and we didn't really kind of participate, we had no idea of what kinds of things were out there in terms of geography. Of course, now in the digital age, we live in an era where we have an embarrassment of riches in terms of the kinds of things that we can do. But making students aware of these kinds of things is a big part of the task. And a lot of like how you can apply these uh, tools and techniques with this. So um, students are able to learn uh, or earn uh, service hours with this. Um, it's designed to be informal. It's designed to be fun. It's, it's uh, formed as an after-school club, so it's not like really integrated into the curriculum. Um, I, I mentioned this yesterday, if you were in my talk about uh, Teach OSM. A lot of high school teachers have very little latitude in terms of what they can include in the classroom on a daily basis. And there is um, a, a heavy emphasis on having to teach for the test. 
Uh, there's a lot of you know, standards of learning in a lot of states that are required, and they have to meet those first. So uh, giving teachers the latitude to conduct this as a, uh, as a, a after school club gives them kind of a lot of latitude in terms of the implementation that they want to do it. So um, we have one teacher, for example, who is uh, you know, conducting this as part of her um, home room first thing in the day. So her students come in and those who want to show up and map, they can uh, come in and, and map that. There is an opportunity for um, students who are engaged in this um, to uh, take on leadership roles. And these things um, include the blog posts and things like that, but they also include things like um, organizing their own events and mapping things. So um, the opportunity here is for this leadership, but also student-directed inquiry, which is really important. So they're kinds of they're the ones who are really coming up with like, what are the cool things that I really want to digitize? What are the kind of things that I want to see on the map? And those can be really interesting things. Um, this is, uh, I, I like this slide. I, I, I uh, please don't press me for sources on this uh, in terms of the OSM con contributions by gender. Uh, but I think it's, uh, regardless, it's not far from the truth. Um, as, as an OpenStreetMap project, we've long uh, suffered, not suffered, but we've, we've kind of uh, labored to kind of in, be more inclusive in terms of who is involved with the mapping community. And uh, I like this because to me it demonstrates the ability to use something like a club like this to encourage um, a, a, broader, uh, a broader group of students and include more students in, in, um, in, ge in geosciences. There is, uh, in terms of mentorship, um, we've uh, gotten a lot of uh, Kerry Stokes, for example, from USAID, uh, Catherine Nakalembe, who's a, a, a food expert, um, who's talked about um, you know, food resources, and a lot of these uh, uh, Patricia Solis and talking about um, youth mappers. So we've had opportunities to get um, interesting speakers to show kinds of pathways to students that can take open street map skills and kind of kind of visualize what a career in in geospatial sciences could um, could envision could include. Here's the plans uh, for this first year. We are. Um, during this year is to establish, we've got five chapters now. Um, the idea is to have by uh, December have about 12 to 15 chapters of this and expand this to a year-round uh, year program. Um, we are um, eagerly awaiting the development of the OSM sandbox, which I think will be a nice adjunct to uh, including into this um, into the, um, into the fold of, of tools that we're using. We've also gotten a, a lot of uh, mentorship and contributions from the Youth Mappers Validation Hub. And uh, in, it, it's really nice, it's been a really nice relationship because uh, high school students haven't, you know, they naturally look up to college students as peers and, you know, closer in their peer groups uh, than, say, me. And uh, it, makes it, it makes it nice to kind of have a youth mapper kind of giving feedback to high school students. So that's a, that's a, a big plus with this. Um, next year, 25, 26, we want to expand this to 20 or 25 chapters. Um, transitioning to a more self-sustaining model, more like youth mappers, where there's kind of a more of a, a package where here's what you need to do, add water and stir, and you've got a team activist chapter with this. The implementation of the validation hub, um, more implementation of the validation hub, which I think is nice to have a little bit more connective fiber between youth mappers and the team activists. So it's a really nice, I, I, I really um, like the uh, community development aspect of this. So the year three is a major rollout. Is We're hoping to uh, roll this out to about 50 chapters or so, something like that. That's... Uh, that's about it. So that's Team Aptivist in a nutshell, I think. Questions now or questions later or? Questions now? We can take a few questions now. Jimmy. Hello, I'm Jimmy Rocks. Um, I, I wanted to ask about uh, how you said it's really hard to get this stuff into the class itself. And you did mention that 
one of the teachers is doing homebrew. Um, are there, is a lot of it like after school activities or other things? Like how are you incorporating this into the classes? It's not really being incorporated like in geography class. So when you go to geography class as a high school student, um, you won't find it in, in the classroom lectures or things like that. So with an after school club, we have a little bit more latitude in terms of allowing the teachers to kind of choose when they implement it. So if they, like we, our one teacher who, who prefers to implement it at the beginning of the day, that works for her. Um, some of them it works better at the end of the day. It also helps us to kind of um, take bite-sized chunks when we have, uh, if, we, if we do it as an after-school club, we can, um, you know, we could get 7, 10, 15 students that are kind of self-selected. Um, we, it, it, it always, um, we have a lot of teachers that sometimes their enthusiasm exceeds their technical ca capability for supporting mapathons. And um, I always cringe when I have an enthusiastic teacher who wants to sponsor a mapathon for 150 students at their school, and I'm just you know thinking data quality. Um, so uh, this this is a much more manageable way to kind of introduce introduce that. So yeah, Jeff. You use the term uh, self-directed inquiry in your talk. Can you give some examples of self-directed inquiry that students would be interested yeah, in using? Yeah, it, it's kind of based on the project-based learning methodology where um, student-led inquiry is um, focused on, they're kind of talking amongst themselves to determine what sorts of feature they want to map, what sorts of geographic scope they want to cover, and what sorts of impact that they want to have. So examples for this are, um, pedestrian safety around schools. That's a huge one, it's hugely popular. Um, and bike racks and bus stops are, are, are a, a key one for students that want to, so it's, when I say student-led inquiry, it's like, well, what do you want to map? And how do you want to map it? So that's, that's generally what it is. And that's, that's done by consensus, I guess, with students who kind of debate what they want to do and, and, and think of the features that they want to map, geographic scope and things like that. Is that? Yeah. yeah. Yes? Uh, you mentioned uh, an OpenStreetMap sandbox. Uh, what's your imagination of like how that would ideally look or pan out? Oh, excellent question. Thank you. Um, so the sandbox, uh, you know, we've long toyed with this idea. If we had some uh, play, a safe space that we could turn students, new mappers, we could turn them loose in this sandbox, they could map with impunity and they could make all sorts of mistakes. And um, you know, it's uh, we had a student once who uh, put like a fourteen thousand foot waterfall with an obscene uh, label on it, and. 14-year-old boys will do that sort of thing. And um, so having a sandbox where they can put those sorts of things in and then we can erase it at the end of the day or at the end of the semester or things like that, that, that would be a boon to us without having to, you know, so students could map in a, in a risk-free environment. So they could make all the mistakes they want. The teachers could assess their mapping capabilities and, and uh, did you square your buildings? Did you use the name field as a descriptor? Do you have a, a highway and a node, a highway and a house sharing a node, for example, things like that. A teacher could use the sandbox to kind of enforce a rubric, to, to assign a grade to students, uh, you know, assess their mapping and, and assign a grade with that. And then the, then the sandbox could be wiped clean. So, for example, one of our teachers in uh, Katy, Texas, Greg Hill, his big thing is for get his students to map the campus. And so what Greg would like to do is get his students to map the canvas and then clear it out after, at the end of the semester. And when he gets a new, you know, when he gets three more classes of 30 students, he can say, okay, we're going out to map the campus. And they could map the campus again. But, you know, you could do this, you know, lather, rinse, and repeat often enough and, and clear it. Um, so there's a number of different ways we can implement it, and um, actually to that end, I'm, I've uh, at our education working group meeting in a couple weeks, I've asked uh, Quincy to uh, attend so we can gather some more requirements to kind of specify and lock that down just how the sandbox will work. So it's still in flux. So one more question or? Yeah, are there any other questions? Yes. Martine.
So the, the Stan Sandbox got me thinking. Have you ever considered um, trying to have students let them loose on open geo fiction? I, you know, I haven't. Uh, I've, I know about it, and I haven't done it. Um, open geo fiction, and somebody else at one point, I don't know, a couple of years ago, said, "Have you uh, the Dev instance for OpenStreetMap is another another opportunity where you could just turn students loose, but." Um, as I understand it, geofiction is kind of uh, quirky, and you have to. There's a sign-up process, and you have to be vetted, and you know, before you're allowed to like create a fantasy island in open geofiction, you have to jump through a lot of hoops, and you have to have a certain reputation and things like that. So, I haven't really explored geofiction to be to be quite candid. It's probably got some potential, but it's it's been unexplored because um, the barriers were kind of too high. At, at the beginning, so haven't adventured it. Okay, I think I'm done, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, this is a great initiative.